The lava lake in Nirgongo Volcano is one of the most incredible sights on our angry planet. In 2002, the volcano erupted, killing many people, splitting the city of Goma with a river of molten lava, and making refugees out of over 120,000 people. I wanted to see this dangerous volcano and to explore the risk it presents to the people and the wildlife of the Congo. Right now, I'm on my way to the Democratic Republic of Congo. In 2002, the Nirigongo volcano there erupted, sending a river of lava into the city of Goma. It takes about two and a half days just to get there, and this is the beginning of the trek. Should be a long one, but this is a place I've really been looking forward to going for a long, long time. It's no easy feat just to get to this place. We've got to take the red-eye flight across uh, the Atlantic to London. Then it's another red-eye flight from London to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Then another flight from there to Kigali, Rwanda. And then we travel by land from Rwanda into the Congo, and that's just to get to the city at the base of the volcano. So it's definitely an epic. This is flight one of three just to get into Rwanda. A lot of turbulence over the Atlantic tonight. It's been up and down and bumping around. I think I got maybe one hour sleep. Well, there's a reason why they call it the Red Eye. Just spent two nights on a plane in a row, but finally made it to Kigali, the capital of Rwanda. Just coming back from the airport now, just checking out the city. All our bags arrived, so I'm pretty happy. It's great to be back in Africa. <laughs> the people of Rwanda and Congo have an amazing spirit. With everything that's happened in this place, they're still so full of life. There's a rhythm to life in Africa. You can feel it the moment you arrive. This is the central market here in uh, Kigali in Rwanda. It's a very busy place. As I shop for provisions for the trek, there's a definite tension in the market. Everyone knows I'm a stranger, and people seem to be keeping a close eye on me. All right. Here we are in Kigali, and here's our destination, Goma. So we have to go northwest, and then into Goma. So Gisenyi is here. Goma, and then the volcano will be right here. I'm traveling with a group of scientists and adventurers from Europe, Saudi Arabia, and North America. There's a lot of planning necessary to get us all up there and back safely. Very far down, but yeah, I half a kilometer. <laughs> you bring uh, half a kilometer worth of rope? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I brought my parachute. <laughs> I can't believe I'm this close to Miragongo. I've been dreaming about this place for, well, forever, really. With all the instability in the area and just the physical difficulties of getting to the volcano, I can't believe I'm actually here. Now it's time to head for Goma, with some very scary weather ahead. Last night there was torrential rain. So much, it woke me up, and I don't think I've ever been woken up with just pure rain before. Driving conditions are great today. Well, almost. This happens to me every time I'm in Africa. Some type of catastrophic vehicle failure at an inopportune time. If I had a clamp 
if I could clamp the wires right onto the terminal, but I don't think I have any like that here. Eventually, we get the van fixed and press on. But every time we stop to take photographs, we're mobbed by curious kids, fascinated by our cameras. All right. Hey, that's good. As darkness falls, we get back on the road. But of course, now the headlights won't work, and we have to pull out one of our movie lights to try and illuminate the sea of humanity on the side of the road. Okay, this is probably one of the hairiest adventures yet. We're actually on a dirt road in rural Rwanda, no lights. Headlights are gone from the car because of an electrical problem we had earlier in the day. It's probably only a matter of time before we end up in the ditch. The terrifying volcanic eruption at Niragongo is one of the many tragedies that Central Africa has endured. In 1994, Rwanda suffered through one of the worst genocides of modern times. The memory of it is still fresh. It left millions either dead or homeless. This is in Parama Church where 5,000 Tutsis fled and then hid here so in seek of protection. And uh, the Interamis came and then killed them and butchered them, this particular church. You can see from the other side where they hacked through using machetes, hand axes, and grenades so as to kill the people who were inside. In the Netarama church, 5,000 Tutsis seeking refuge were all slaughtered by the Hutus. Their skulls, their bones, their blood-soaked clothes have been preserved as a memorial to the massacre. Unimaginable. The animals of Central Africa have also taken a terrible beating from the civil wars of the last 15 years. I wanted to see how the mountain gorillas living on the Virunga volcanoes, the famous gorillas in the mist, were doing. This jungle path leads up through the Virungas, and it's one of the only places on Earth where you can see the rare mountain gorillas. Only about 700 left on the planet. They're hard to find, too. Getting closer to where the gorillas are. What a remarkable sight. These creatures have survived the ravages of man, largely because of people like Diane Fossey, who fought off poachers and the modern world to save them from extinction. When I arrived, I discovered two babies in the area, which definitely heightens the danger. This baby looks cute, but if the adults sense any threat from us, we'd be in serious danger, and I wouldn't stand a chance against a 400-pound silverback. There are only 700 of these magnificent animals left in the world, and they're constantly being threatened by poachers. This is no petting zoo. No, we only had one hour with the gorillas. It's pretty amazing to see. They're so much like us. Playing, fighting, hanging out with each other, sleeping. Awesome, amazing. We arrive in Goma, our last stop before base camp. To put it mildly, Goma isn't Beverly Hills. How poor is the Eastern Congo? In Goma, they make their own bicycles out of wood. When we start handing out dollar bills to our photographic subjects, it almost causes a riot. 
It's a rough scrabble border town, and as we arrive, they're about to have their first elections in 45 years, so tensions are high. Watch out, there's some soldiers here, guys. All right. Check point or something. Oh, yes. Okay, we're in Goma right now, and we just got stopped for filming, and uh, some kind of secret police or some kind of uh, ununiformed uh, police officer just pulled us over, and we've been dragged over to the Bureau of Finance to have to pay up for a <laughs> for a permit. I mean, we could have got arrested, but um, we were kind of warned about Goma. It's a bit of a rough town, so I'm kind of doing this on the sly. Okay, so we finally got we got our filming permit here. So we had to stop in. We were delayed for 20 minutes, half an hour. Not too bad by African standards. And uh, we're back on the road again. But not for long. That one. No? No. Okay. Alright. What was that? Don't make don't, pictures. Don't take pictures. Well, our car just got stopped again, second time. And there was uh, a checkpoint with numerous soldiers. I don't know how many more checkpoints and stops we'll have along this route, but uh, Goma is definitely a rough place. In 2002, Niragongo had a massive eruption that sent lava flowing right through the city of Goma. The disaster brought more hardship to a city that has suffered war and poverty for decades. While in Congo, I met with Jacques Durieux, a French scientist who's been living in Goma and studying the volcano for 30 years. Uh, during the last eruption in 2002, we have been extremely lucky because the lava flows so at the tent of the city were moving at a speed between five and eight kilometers per hour allowing the people to, to run away. If we do have in the city, lava flows at a speed between, I don't know, 20 to 40 kilometers per hour, it will be a huge catastrophe. Uh, that eruption just occurred after 11 years of war. And the volcano was more impressive to the people than the 11 years of war. This lava flow actually split the city of Goma right in half. Across the road, across the airport, went right into the lake, Lake Kivu. It was the lowest fracture point on the volcano. And it's an extremely wide lava flow here, and literally it divided the, the city right in half. The lava of Niragongo is some of the fastest flowing in the world. In the 1977 eruption, even elephants were caught by the roaring river of lava. Although even with our filming permit, we can't film at the airport, so you can't see the lava across the tarmac, but it's uh, quite a sight to see, cut right through the middle of the city and all the way down to the lake. It's tremendous seeing this. It must have been incredibly hot. What a sight back in 2002 when this came through. This is what flowed through the city. In 2002, cars and trucks were engulfed before they could be moved, and they're still there today, a permanent reminder of the power and unpredictability of an active volcano. See the boy peeking out from the back of that rusted truck? Hard to believe, but that's his home now. If Niragongo blows its stack again, what will happen to this shanty town and the people that live in it? We're at base camp here. We got all our equipment, food, water, supplies, tents, everything we need for the next three days on top of the mountain. You can't really see the volcano too well right now because of all the haze and the clouds, but it's going to take about four to six hours to get to the top. So we're here now, and I'm told we will go up to the coulee <laughs> and then up to the fracture. Now the day-long trek up the volcano has begun. The last leg of our journey, six hours straight up. The local porters are incredible. This is a challenging climb, and these guys do it at speed. They also have pretty interesting stories to tell about their experiences with Niragongo. 
y avait trois, il y avait trois hommes qui étaient morts dans cette éruption. Il y avait beaucoup de maisons qui ont été cassées et blirées beaucoup avec des plantes, des haricots, des patates douces, des pommes de terre, des choux, yeah. des bananes. Tout s'était brûlé. Wow. This is one of the fissures from the 2002 eruption. Right along here, lava poured out towards Goma. We wanted to climb down into the fissures of the volcano to try and get a sense of whether it was getting ready to blow up on the people of Goma again. It's free. Okay. Pull and it locks. All right. Squeeze and it's free. I'll place the rope pad. Good. What's it like? But in spite of all our preparation, it's just too hot. It uh, gets uh, pretty tough to take after a while. Not worth going any deeper. Not without an air-conditioned suit. <sighs> when the lava flowed through here in 2002, this was actually a rainforest. And you see a lot of these casts from the trees that used to be here. The lava flowed around the trees and then burned the trunks out. So you've got these holes all the way up the path to the summit. About two hours left to climb. The steepest part. Just keeps getting steeper and steeper. Not too far from the top, maybe 15, 20 minutes. But it's extremely steep trying to get up this. It's you gotta go really slow. And of course, it's all this loose rock. It's so treacherous. And it's been raining, so there's mud. It's been a long day of just trudging up this hill. I can't wait to get to the top of this thing. It's about bloody time. Hey, George, come on up. Have a look. This is it. Oh, this is great. You're impressed. Oh, man. That is awesome. Congratulations, guys. You made it. Congratulations. That's what I'm talking about. Look at that. Welcome to the top. After five years of planning, five days of traveling, and five hours of climbing, It just gives you an idea of the visibility. Since we're socked in with cloud right now, there's nothing we can do. Just waiting for the Niragongo weather to clear. Okay, well things have now gone from bad to worse. Much worse. Before we had fog and now we've got torrential thunderstorms. It's pouring down right now. The wind is battering this tent and I hope it holds together. Whoa. We're at the top of this mountain and uh, our risk of getting struck by lightning is increasing every second. The storm has been absolutely relentless. It hasn't given up for almost two days now. All last night, raining, thunder, wind, howling, visibility. I can barely see my hand in front of my face. It's one of the worst conditions I've ever been in. There were times where I thought the tent was either gonna wash away from the rain or get blown off the mountainside from the wind. And uh, it's just harsh. These conditions are testing the limits of even the most seasoned explorers. My mouth feels disgusting, my back is sore. I'm hungry, I'm extremely tired. Slightly dehydrated. And I want some good weather. It looks like fog, but we're actually in the cloud deck. So hopefully it'll burn off later today when it warms up a bit. But for now, 
We're not seeing lava. We're not seeing the crater. I can barely see 10 feet ahead of me. It will change. Just wait. Just wait a minute. <laughs> or two. Oh, it'll change. It'll get much, much worse. Because of the deteriorating weather conditions, we use our satellite phone to relay information about our situation. Oh, yeah, the crater is absolutely huge. And uh, I'm really hoping that it clears out before we have to come back down the mountain to get another good look at this thing. So we're basically on 24-hour watch, and if anyone sees it clear up, then they let everybody else know. Thunderstorms have cleared off and it's finally stopped raining. And now, you can finally get a really good look at the lava lake down there, about 500 meters straight down. After months of planning and a long, backbreaking journey, we've made it. Now, we wait for darkness to witness one of the rarest and most spectacular sights on the planet, Niragongo. This is a window into the core of the Earth, 2,000 degrees of molten fury. It's an amazing sight, and a reassuring one. The boiling, exploding cauldron of lava actually means the volcano is controllably venting off its energy. For now, it seems the 600,000 people of Goma are safe. But who knows what tomorrow will bring to this corner of darkest and hottest Africa. This truly is an angry planet. <laughs>